right. I think we should um, get this rolling. What do you think, Dr. Rogers? Sounds good. We're coming up on 1230. So let's yeah. talk about labrum. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. I'm Dr. Ambak. I'm joined by Dr. Chris Rogers. And uh, welcome to our Ask the Docs series. Uh, for those of you who have attended us before, uh, this is a 30 minute question and answer session wherein we go live and we answer questions about certain orthopedic uh, conditions. We uh, choose a topic every week that we discuss. And uh, we also discuss um, innovative treatments uh, to treat these conditions. So I think this is our sixth session. Um, our topic for today is labrum tear. We get uh, these questions a lot from our patients. So I think it would be um, a good topic to discuss. Uh, before I start, I will have Dr. Rogers do a quick introduction on our clinic, uh, San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group and what we do. Thank you, Dr. Ambach. Uh, yes, so I'm Chris Rogers. I'm a, a board certified physical medicine rehab physician and founder of San Diego Orthobiologics. I apologize for the jewelry today. I did injure my neck over the weekend, but I'm making speedy recovery, so no need to send flowers just yet. Uh, I'm working from my home office today, and Dr. Ambach has been holding down the fort along with our excellent SDOMG team. So thank you, Dr. Ambach, for that. Um, but I should be back soon. Um, and we founded San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group um, more than four years ago, knowing that the future of orthopedic care would involve use of uh, orthobiologics. And orthobiologics simply are therapies that use your own cells or molecules from your cells to decrease inflammation and decrease pain, and maybe most importantly, to stimulate healing in injured tissues. And so we see a lot of patients with injured tendons uh, cartilage. Uh, and today we're going to talk about labral tears and labral injuries and how we use orthobiologics for that. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. So for those of you who are joining us through Zoom, uh, there is a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and you can go ahead and type in your questions about labrum tear. Um, for those of you who are joining us through Facebook, uh, you can write your questions in the comments section and we will answer them as they come. If you have a more, um, if you have a question of a more personal nature, we would prefer that you call us or you email us so that we can discuss these uh, conditions in more detail. All right, my first question, uh, Dr. Rogers, before we start this topic, uh, let's define what uh, a labrum is. What is a labrum and what causes it to tear? Well, a labrum in Latin means lip. And so um, the labrum is a specialized piece of cartilage in your body that uh, forms a lip around the edge of a joint. Dr. Ambach, how many labrums do we have in our body? So we have a labrum in our shoulder joint and we have a labrum in our hip joint. That's exactly and right. So we have four labrums. I don't know if it is correctly labri, I don't know, but maybe one of our Latin scholars can tell us. <laughs> so the labrum represents this uh, sort of an O-ring or a, a circular shaped rim on the edge of either the socket in your shoulder or the socket in your hip. And uh, this does a number of things. It improves the stability of the joint. It provides um, almost a suction mechanism that helps keep the ball in the socket, both in the shoulder and in the hip. Uh, and it also helps lubricate the joint. And so this cartilage tissue is very important for normal joint function. Uh, but it is cartilage. And as we know, as we've heard from previous webinars, cartilage has a hard time healing when it becomes injured. And there are many different ways. So I don't know, we haven't prepared Dr. Ambach. Should we talk about shoulders first or talk about hips first? Yeah, well, we, we can do either. I just wanted to add uh, to what Dr. Rogers has, has said. If you um, imagine your shoulder and your hip joint as a ball in a socket, right? You've got that that socket, which is uh, called the acetabulum in the hip, and it's called the glenoid in the shoulder. And that labrum, as Dr. Rogers said, is that rim. It's that fiber cartilage that kind of surrounds the rim in your socket. And uh, aside from the other uh, functions that Dr. Rogers has mentioned, um, it, it provides a stability. It also acts as an attachment of ligaments, especially in the shoulder. And uh, it increases the surface area of contact uh, within the ball and the socket of your joint, 
which is very important, especially for the shoulder joint, because the socket in the shoulder joint is not as big as the hip joint. So if your hip joint has a big socket, the, the shoulder joint has a very small socket. So it's uh, more um, at risk for instability. So let's go ahead, Dr. Rogers, and talk about um, the causes of labrum tear. You can start with the hip and I can uh, go with the uh, shoulder. What causes labrum tear and what causes um, labrum degeneration? Yeah, so typically uh, a labral tear, um, well, in our clinic most commonly is de degenerative in nature. And so there may be some biomechanical abnormalities of the hip. In some cases, the shapes of the bones may be um, aberrant in that the ball may not be perfectly round. It may have an, a little bump to it, uh, something that we call a cam lesion, uh, or the, the acetabulum, the cup, the socket of the hip may have a little extra over coverage uh, almost acting like a little bone spur. And this just puts excessive um, stress on the joint, on the labrum, and can predispose patients to uh, tearing that. We also see it traumatically uh, in uh, athletes. Um, we've seen a number of soccer players, football players, uh, people who maybe um, twist the hip in an unusual way that puts stress on the labrum, causing it to tear. That's right. So those are what we call an impingement lesions. So what Dr. Rogers were, was just uh, describing. The patients also know them as FAI or femoral acetabular impingement. Um, for the shoulder, the causes of labrum tear are the same, wherein most of the, the causes are cumulative uh, trauma and degeneration that causes uh, tearing. Um, the shoulder, uh, in addition, because it's not a, a, a very stable joint, uh, it's more prone for dislocation, uh, wherein the ligaments get lax and the, the joint gets out of place. And that's one mechanism wherein the labrum can be torn, in addition to uh, cumulative trauma and, uh, and degeneration. Um, so let's discuss what are the symptoms for a, a labrum tear and labrum degeneration. You want to discuss the hip symptoms? Sure, in the, in the hip. Uh, probably 90% of our patients will note pain in the front of the hip, uh, particularly in the groin area. Uh, this could be aggravated by pulling the knee up to the chest uh, or bending in a way that would, would simulate that motion, what we call hip flexion. Uh, patients may have trouble getting in and out of bed or getting in and out of a car, uh, or they may have trouble with rotation maneuvers of the hip uh, where that injured tissue becomes uh, pinched. Uh, in addition, they can have a generalized ache that could involve the side of the hip or even the buttock area because remember the cartilage itself, the labrum itself doesn't have nerves in it, but when it's torn, it will release proteins that irritate the inner lining of the joint. And that inner lining, that synovial tissue, that tissue that makes your synovial fluid that lubricates and nourishes the joint, uh, can become inflamed and become painful. And so patients will often have an ache, uh, which makes them wanna to go to the store and buy some ibuprofen or something to decrease the inflammation. Uh, the problem is when the tear is ongoing, uh, that, doesn't, you know, that pill doesn't solve the problem, it just masks the symptoms. Um, so, so it's not unusual for patients to come to us, they say I've had chronic you know, pain in my front of the hip or an ache. Uh, sometimes it's worse at night, sometimes it's worse with certain physical activities. Uh, but that's, that's probably the most common scenario that we see. That's right. And in the shoulder, the symptoms are, are similar, wherein you can have pain in the joint, and that could be in the front of the joint, in the side, or even in the back of the joint, um, because of that uh, instability um, that I was talking about. Sometimes patients can have pain in their biceps tendon, um, as well, because the, the attachment of your biceps tendon is right at the region of the labrum where it is most commonly torn. So we call that a slap lesion, uh, S-L-A-P. And that's one of the most common uh, types of tear of uh, labrum in the shoulder. So patients can have pain in the front of their, their shoulder where their biceps are uh, is located. Um, patients may also have uh, some clicking or uh, popping sensation in their shoulder. And um, most of the time, these labrum uh, tears have coexisting um, uh, abnormalities like joint arthritis or rotator cuff tears, at least in the shoulder. So patients can have difficulty 
with uh, moving their shoulder, uh, doing their range of motion, um, or uh, they may be tender to pressure in that region. And we should probably differentiate, Dr. Rombach, that there's a big difference between the young, maybe athlete, versus those of us who are over 50. Uh, those of us who are over 50, um, whatever you do, do not get an MRI of your shoulder or your hip because you just don't want to know. There's a high probability that you have a tear in your labrum and don't even know it yet because you've been fortunate enough to not irritate it. But in younger people, it's less common, but even still 20% of younger people, you know, so let's say late 20s, early 30s can still have, uh, in, I'm talking to shoulder now, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm talking to hip now, uh, can have labral tear on their MRI just completely asymptomatic, no pain. Going back to that shoulder, um, the, the younger person usually injures it. So like Dr. Ambach says, that bicep tendon attaches to the labrum. So if there's a forceful you know, movement that involves the bicep muscle, they can tear that anchor uh, from the labrum. Uh, those are treated very differently than say those of us who are older who are just wearing out. Our labrum is wearing out, it's degenerating just like the rest of the cartilage in the joint. And That's so, right. you know, the younger patients are more amenable to a surgical intervention, whereas the rest of us, the, the studies so far show that surgical intervention is really not very, uh, very successful in the shoulder. And to complicate matters in the older patient, it's more than just a labral tear. We don't, we don't just find a labral tear. We also may find tendon tears, you know, rotator cuff tears. Uh, we may even find arthritis in the joint. So it becomes much more complicated an issue in those of us who are over 50. That's right. I think about uh, two thirds of patients from 45 to 60 year old have abnormal um, findings in their MRI or a labrum tear with no symptoms at all. So um, as we always say in our webinars and our lectures, we don't diagnose uh, patients by MRI. Uh, we diagnose them by history and a physical exam. So uh, with regards to labrum tear, how do you diagnose labrum tear and labrum degeneration? Oh, well, in, by physical exam in the shoulder, uh, there's different maneuvers um, that you can read about that involve uh, essentially stressing the joint to see if it's unstable, uh, check the surrounding structures to see if they've been torn or injured. Um, but uh, there's been a number of, um, physical exam findings have been described in literature. Unfortunately, these are not very well validated measures. Uh, a lot of them are frankly, strictly anecdotal. There's been a couple of published papers, you know, some of these things we've been taught in med school to test for, uh, were only tested on one or two patients, you know, in the published literature. So uh, a lot of times these are um, either picked up by signs or symptoms of instability, clicking in the shoulder, mechanical, um, uh, uh, disruption of the joint on physical exam. By the way, we do ultrasound in the office. Ultrasound is not very good at detecting labral tears, typically uh, in the shoulder or the hip for that matter. Uh, typically an MRI is gonna be more sensitive, uh, more specific. Uh, and some could even argue that contrast enhanced or an arthrogram might be necessary to pick up some very subtle lesions. Although in our clinic, that's not typically necessary. That's right. So we diagnose these labrum injuries through uh, history taking, a complete history taking, a detailed physical exam, uh, and images if necessary, either an x-ray to determine if there's any bony abnormalities, or we get an MRI, as Dr. Rogers said, with contrast um, to see uh, labrum degeneration. But um, as we said, because labrum tear is typically actually not the cause of the patient's pain. Usually the pain is coming from the joint itself like osteoarthritis or degeneration in the cartilage or even uh, the structures around it like uh, inflammation of the bursa, which we call the bursitis or in the um, shoulder, maybe some a tear in the uh, rotator cuff um, or a tear in the gluteal tendons with regards to the hip. So, um, it, it, it's, you have to put in all this, uh, these measures to see if the pain is really coming from the, the labrum tear. Uh, but as, as we have mentioned, you know, most of the time, uh, especially for patients who are not um, 
athletes, as Dr. Rogers has said, most of the time, the, the cause is more cumulative trauma and degeneration. The pain is coming from a multifactorial um, a cause and not necessarily from the labrum itself. Yeah. So, yeah, I think what you're hearing us say is that each patient is unique and, you know, we need to look at all the structures in the shoulder or all the structures in the hip to best identify which treatment plans could be most appropriate for you. Some of our patients may need surgery and it's important for us to identify those patients early. So patients who maybe have gross instability or repetitive instability of their shoulder joint or patients who have severe loss of motion or mechanical in, uh, impingement uh, where the tissues are approximating and causing pain. Some of those patients may do well um, with an arthroscopic debridement in the hip. Uh, but the vast majority of patients, I think the literature would support th this comment the vast majority of patients can be managed with non-surgical care, which typically includes, you know, physical therapy, rehabilitation, focusing on improving motion, improving stability in the joint, uh, managing symptoms, showing the patient how to protect the injury so they don't make it worse. And then we'll talk about some of the other things we're doing for those patients who maybe need a little more care. That's right. So going into the questions for treatment, how do we treat these injuries? Um, the traditional standard treatment, as Dr. Rogers has mentioned, is a good rehab program to support, uh, to strengthen the support structures, maybe some anti-inflammatories to help with the pain and inflammation, and then um, a surgical intervention for those who are appropriate candidates. Um, for those patients who fail conservative measures or who are not candidates for surgery for uh, various reasons, then there's this option of uh, cell therapy or um, orthobiologics to treat um, your uh, degeneration in your leg room and your joint. Um, before we go into the cell therapy, um, Dr. Rogers, there's a question regarding frozen shoulder and is this considered a leg room problem? I see. Uh, frozen shoulder is a term uh, that refer, for those who don't already know, that refers to the patient who has significant loss of motion. Maybe they can't rotate their arm this way like they normally would. Frozen shoulder is usually due to inflammation of the lining of the joint. We talked about how the, the joint, the ball in the socket and the shoulder uh, uh, has this lining, this tissue that can become inflamed. It can adhere to itself. And when it adheres to itself, it sort of shrink wraps that lining so that you lose motion in the joint. Uh, it's associated with many things. Uh, labral tear might be one, rotator cuff tear might be another. Some medical conditions such as diabetes or other inflammatory diseases can be associated with frozen shoulder. Um, the prognosis is usually pretty good. It takes a long time for these patients to recover, but the important thing for us as physicians is to identify any po other possible reversible cause, whether it's a you know, soft tissue injury in the shoulder or a metabolic problem. Uh, so. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, indicative of a labral tear, but it, it can be associated with a labral tear. That's correct. So um, for those of you who have attended our sessions in the past, we have a dedicated special sessions to talk uh, uh, in detail about cell therapies. There's two kinds of cell therapies that we uh, use in the clinic. The more common a cell therapy is called platelet-rich plasma wherein we use a concentrated amount of uh, a platelets in your plasma, which is derived from your blood. Um, and we use this concentrated platelets, which has hundreds and hundreds of growth factors to help heal and repair your orthopedic injuries or orthopedic conditions. The other cell uh, therapy that we use is called cell-based therapies that are derived from either your bone marrow or from your fat tissue. And this uh, contains, along with other repair proteins, they contain adult, adult stem cells that are special cells um, in, in the sense that they, they not only replicate uh, and renew themselves, but they also have the ability to differentiate or turn into the, the tissue or cells that your body needs. And um, there's uh, hundreds of studies that have shown um, the use of this cell therapy for many orthopedic conditions for joint osteoarthritis, for example, uh, it has been documented in many uh, studies with regards to the, the safety and efficacy of the use of these treatments in improving the, the cartilage condition in your joint, is stopping the progression of the arthritis, uh, decreasing uh, inflammation and improving the pain and function uh, in these patients that have this. 
Um, Dr. Rogers, do you want to discuss how PRP works and how stem cell works? Yeah, um, so two different things, right? They're both orthobiologics. Uh, platelets are cells in your blood that produce chemicals that we call growth factors and cytokines and other things uh, that you don't need to memorize. But these, these molecules talk to the existing tissues when we inject the platelets into the into the area and inform those cells how to function better. So in the case of a cartilage lesion, a cartilage injury, for example, the growth factors might encourage the cartilage cells to grow in number, or they might encourage those cells to produce more collagen, which is a protein important for your, uh, for your cartilage, uh, or aggregate, or many of the other substances that are the stuff that makes up your cartilage. Uh, that's on the regenerative side. On the inflammatory and pain side, there are many of these growth factors and cytokines that are anti-inflammatory. So when you have an injury, a labral injury, you have inflammation in the joint, uh, that's because your immune system is overactivated. When you inject platelets, uh, they release these molecules that tone down the immune system and decreases the inflammation very much like a cortisone shot would, or ibuprofen for that matter. The difference is, of course, these are your own cells. It's not a drug. And the results tend to last longer. Now, I'm speaking generally about PRP in a joint. I want to point out, Dr. Ambach and I pride ourselves in being what we call evidence-based physicians. That means we're not going to recommend something for you unless we have evidence of safety and efficacy. And so if you were to go do a literature search right now on the effect of platelet-rich plasma for labral tear in the shoulder or labral tear in the hip, you're gonna find that there are really no studies in the shoulder labrum. And there's one study that I'm aware of in the hip. And that one study had eight patients. So you say, well, where's the evidence? Well, we don't have prospective randomized clinical trials. We will someday soon, hopefully. So we are extrapolating our knowledge of other cartilage lesions where platelet-rich plasma has been studied. We understand the mechanism of these biologics. We understand the mechanism and the biology of a cartilage injury and inflammation in the joint. So we are extrapolating our knowledge from that, but we are not nearly at the point where we want to be where we can say, now, I will tell you, we have a um, registry. So we do track our patient's outcomes. So there was a period of time where I treated um, this young ballerina with hip labral tear and we treated her with PRP, she did very well. Next thing you know, we're treating about a dozen ballerinas with hip labral tears, because all her friends had hip labral tears. And so, so we became sort of the center for labral tears in the hip. We've seen a lot of athletes. We were clever enough back then years ago to know that tracking patient, our patients' outcomes was important. So we have our own internal database. We haven't published that data, um, but I can say now we have a larger database than is in the published literature. So we have some evidence, but I just want people to understand, you know, unlike knee osteoarthritis where we have, you know, randomized clinical trials showing, you know, excellent efficacy. Um, we're not quite there with the labral tear literature, uh, but we'll get there. So that's PRP. With stem cells, you know, we, we use uh, tissues that contain stem cells. So we use bone marrow concentrate. We use adipose tissue. Both of these tissues are known to contain stem cells, a certain kind of adult stem cell called the MSC. The MSC uh, is very well characterized. Uh, its effect on the joint has been very well described. It does many of the same things that platelets can do. It can decrease inflammation. It can decrease pain. It can stimulate healing of cartilage and healing of bone and ligament and tendon. Uh, but again, we have really no published studies showing a well-defined protocol with a known stem cell product uh, for a labral tear lesion. Those, those studies are ongoing. That's correct. So um, with regards to these cell therapies, Dr. Rogers and I have reason to believe that it helps a lot of uh, different orthopedic conditions. And because for labrum injuries, um, there, there's almost always associated cartilage damage, which we can help with. And in some cases, there's also concomitant uh, lesions like a tendon injuries or ligament instability, 
which the cell therapist can help with. Uh, there are ways uh, that we can help stabilize that joint and strengthen the tissue with non-surgical means and uh, with natural means. And that's how I think cell-based therapies can help with this, um, these conditions. Also, uh, with regards to, to surgery, again, if, if you're a great uh, candidate for this uh, surgery, usually these are the traumatic lesions with the athletes, you know, they do really well. But for those uh, patients that have concomitant um, lesions like uh, osteoarthritis or uh, a tendon tear or ligament instability, uh, they might not even do well, even with the labrum um, repair. So the, the, the surgical uh, literature for outcomes for labral rep repair is, is still also conflicting. Um, so I think that's where uh, a, a good alternative uh, treatment, which is non-surgical, would be the cell-based therapies for, for us to consider. Um, there's, there's a question here with regards to how do you stop the, the generation of cartilage? <laughs> Don't get older. <laughs> um, well, that's a great question. Uh, by the way, I said don't get older. That's not entirely true. Um, even though osteoarthritis, for example, which is a condition of your cartilage becoming diseased and thinning and becoming de degenerated uh, and you're getting painful arthritis, uh, not every older person will develop osteoarthritis. For example, how many joints do you have in your body? probably 200. I mean, you've got 50 right here in your hand. So not every joint in your body will get osteoarthritis. Not every joint will get cartilage damage. So it's a very complicated thing. And I think we're really just in the last 10 years understanding osteoarthritis better than we have. We used to think of it as a wear and tear thing. It's clearly not a wear and tear thing strictly. But how do you prevent the progression of osteoarthritis? Well, I think the first thing, the obvious thing is keep the joint healthy, keep it strong, keep it mobile. Uh, you know, don't expose yourself to things that uh, might harm the joint. So many of us do things that really we're wearing ourselves down prematurely. You know, you think of your body as a tool. You know, if you had a tool in your toolbox that you used the wrong way, you know, if I used my, I don't know, my wrench as a hammer, after a while, my wrench is no longer functioning very well as a wrench. So people use their hands a lot of times like a wrench or a hammer and they you know, or use their hip or, you know, I like to play golf. I use my spine like a hammer. So, <laughs> you know, get, improve your golf swing, improve your mobility, improve your strength. That's probably, there's probably more evidence for that than there is of anything in medicine. The, the next thing is what happens when that cartilage is already starting to degenerate? Well, we have really good evidence that platelet-rich plasma and stem cells from bone marrow and stem cells from fat can actually slow down or in some cases reverse that degenerative process. And it's a complicated process, but it's, it happens at the genetic level. Certain genes get turned on, certain genes get turned off, and it actually improves the health of the cartilage. Now, can we say that we're making your cartilage you know, 20 years old again? No, but we, there's definitely good animal data and some good human data showing that we are slowing down the progression of osteoarthritis when we inject these orthobiologics. That, that's a great uh, advice, Dr. Rogers. That's always the question that I get from my patients. How do I stop the progression of this cartilage or how do I avoid it? And it's, it's, um, it's a tough uh, question to answer, but there's a lot of things that you can do on your own. We can assist you in getting there to your goals, but a lot of it will fall on you on um, making sure that you're taking good care of your body and uh, having uh, good uh, structural support to your uh, joints and your bones and your, uh, your ligaments. Um, can, I add, can I add two things? Of course. The first thing I'd like to add is there's some good evidence that a low inflammation diet does have a positive impact on your cartilage and on your joint. There are studies that show that people um, who had their their diet followed for months uh, and were rated as either a high inflammatory diet like me, have mac and cheese for dinner, or perhaps like Dr. Ambach who has a very healthy low inflammatory diet. Uh, that those patients who had that low inflammatory diet in general had less osteoarthritis and maybe more importantly, less osteoarthritis associated pain. The other point I would make, uh, and by the way, sleep goes into that because when you don't sleep properly, your 
inflammation in your body increases. So good, I mean, right? This is all intuitive. Get a good night's sleep, exercise, stay strong, stay healthy, eat healthy food. My God, how long have doctors been saying this? But it's true, we have data. The second thing I would say is avoid unnecessary surgery. So there are a number of studies that show that, say for example, you're my age, you're 56 and you have a meniscus tear or even a labral tear in your hip. Surgery doesn't really work very well for those patients and it may actually accelerate the rate of osteoarthritis. So I would say if at all possible, avoid surgery that is unnecessary. That's correct. And one of the conditions um, that we see a lot of uh, surgery being done for that's not really necessary is labrum tear. I mean, how many patients do you, uh, do you see that's coming to the clinic that's saying, I have a labrum tear and I just had you know, a debridement or a repair? You know, about 80%, yeah, a lot, a lot of these patients, you know, majority of them, about 80% of uh, labrum tear, um, especially the ones that are um, uh, progressive or degenerative, uh, do not need surgical intervention. This can be treated um, successfully with conservative measures. And I think that's yeah. where um, your physical therapy, your anti-inflammatories and uh, injection therapies that help um, strengthen and uh, make the joints healthy uh, help. There is an injection called hyaluronic acid um, injection, uh, which is one of the questions that were posted here. And how does it help osteoarthritis? Hyaluronic acid is a vis viscous supplementation gel um, that we inject into your joints. And it, it also has an anti-inflammatory effect, um, just like the steroids, but it's safer than, than the steroids because it doesn't uh, contribute to wearing out of your uh, cartilage if you repetitively use it. So it helps decrease the inflammation. It helps decrease the pain. Um, what it does is it maintains your joint and it kind of stops that, uh, that arthritis or slows down the progression of the arthritis. But it's, it doesn't improve the arthritis. It doesn't reverse the arthritis um, uh, uh, wear out that has already happened. So it's a good temporary uh, procedure that may help with patients. Um, but if your uh, goal is to improve the condition, repair the, the uh, injury, it might not be the best option for you. And it's, to my knowledge, it's only FDA approved device for knee osteoarthritis. That's uh, correct. It's, it's not for any of these things we're talking about, you know, shoulder arthritis, shoulder tear, labral tears, hip labral tears. Uh, but it is commonly used, as you said, for knee osteoarthritis. That's right. Um, so we do this uh, Ask the Doc series every first Wednesday of the month. Every session, we have a special topic. I hope you learned a lot from our topic today, labrum tear and labrum degeneration. Uh, on the second Wednesdays of the month, we go uh, in detail on certain topics. And our topic next week is uh, shoulder injuries. So if you want to learn um, more uh, about shoulder injuries, whether that's uh, joint arthritis or tendon injuries or ligament injuries, uh, join us next week. It will start at 12 uh, and we'll go the, uh, for 30 minutes and then we open um, the stage for uh, 30 minutes of question and answer. Um, thank you everyone for joining us um, and uh, hopefully we see you again soon, Dr. Rogers. Yeah, thank you. And we'd love to answer your questions, save them up for next month. And if you can't wait that long, call us or email us and we'll be happy to answer your questions. That's right. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.